Thanks. Thanks, Lori. So I'm going to discuss a, an abnormality that's extremely common in psychiatric disorders. Uh, the information that, that I have from screening a, a thousand patients consecutively is, is that 25% of, of uh, patients with neurologic and psychiatric disorders have the particular abnormality that I'm going to focus on today. So this is not a, uh, a rare thing. This means if you're in practice and you have 20 patients in a, in a particular uh, week, and, and this affects virtually all psychiatric disorders. So if you have 20 patients in a week, it's likely that four, uh, or, or excuse me, five of them will have uh, this particular abnormality that's contributing uh, to their illness. Okay. And of course, the pointer is not working. Okay. So, uh, so for many uh, years now, uh, increasing information from scientific journals indicates that the intestinal flora is a major factor in mental health. My laboratory had to deal with the issues with the state of New York who, who said that they would only, this was about 20 years ago, they said they would only certify the laboratory if we took out all the information that indicates that microorganisms can affect health. And I said, well, no thanks, we just won't be certified in New York. And so unfortunately that is the case for those of you who are in New York. Uh, we can only serve you if you have an office across the river in New Jersey. So New York is still uh, behind the times. So uh, in, in, uh, in addition, to, uh, to uh, other areas they may be behind. So uh, over, the recent, over recent years, an increasing number of scientific articles have found that microorganisms affect uh, behavior in profound ways. Uh, another uh, article in Dialogues and Clinical uh, neuroscience, that there is a mind-body microbial uh, continuum. And th this first caught my attention while I was working at the Center for Disease Control, in which they were working on developing ways to more rapidly uh, test for certain uh, bacteria of the Clostridium family. And I remember at that point, uh, I asked the uh, researchers, uh, the, uh, why you couldn't just test for these uh, chemicals directly in body fluids, and they indicate, no, it's just not things, uh, the tools are not sensitive enough and so forth. And so I kept this in the back of my mind and thought that someday maybe I'll look at this phenomena and maybe develop a test for it. And, oh, then maybe 20 years later, I actually did it. Uh, the, so uh, this is one from Nature Reviews, that how microorganisms uh, impact both the brain and behavior. Another one in uh, Nature Reviews, and uh, an article from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences showing that uh, lactobacillus alters emotional behavior uh, and affects the central uh, GABA receptor via the vagus nerve, which has nerve endings uh, connected to the intestinal tract. So the particular one that I'm going to uh, focus on today is one in which the biochemistry has now been uh, exhaustively explored and, uh, and uh, confirmed. So there, the, uh, my finding on uh, Clostridia bacteria in the intestine now has been confirmed uh, in five different studies on every part of the world has confirmed the presence of this associated with uh, neuropsychiatric uh, disease. The first article that was published was 
uh, ironically, by a person with the same last name. The co-author was also a Shaw, who to my knowledge has no relation uh, to me. But they found a chemical they called uh, beta-meta-hydroxyphenyl hydrochloric acid. And, and, uh, and so about 50 years after their p publication, I uh, uh, rediscovered the compound that was first reported by them in 1956 that found that mentally ill patients in general have high amounts of this particular chemical. At that time, these individuals did not know the source of this chemical and to my knowledge never did follow-up research. So this is a typical pure science article. You find some amazing piece of evidence and you file it away in your file cabinet to gather dust and mold until someone looks at it again about 50 years later. Uh, and even when I rediscovered it, I didn't know I rediscovered it because the original investigators used a different chemical nomenclature than the one I use most commonly, which is called UPAC. They used an older chemical nomenclature and caught, so I wasn't familiar, didn't even realize that I was rediscovering it until about 10 years after I had been testing this compound, which I uh, termed based on its identification to 3-hydroxyphenyl, 3-hydroxypropionic acid. The, the acronym is what I always use because the, the chemical name is a mouthful, so call it HPHPA. As I mentioned, it's now been uh, confirmed in five different studies uh, throughout the world and have found it in virtually every psychiatric disorder, but the first major paper I published was in uh, the field of autism, and I also reported uh, that there were extremely high amounts in a patient with a first episode of uh, schizophrenia. So this is one of the uh, confirming articles that was uh, in the country of Turkey that uh, uh, also confirmed the finding uh, of this particular chemical in uh, autistic children. Uh, and in other countries, they found other chemicals associated with autism, and specifically, this one is associated with Clostridia difficile called paracresol, P-cresol, which using the UPAC nomenclature is called 4-cresol, which is the identification that we use at the Great Plains Laboratory. Uh, we test this in the organic acid test. Uh, and it was found that high amounts of this cresol were found in cultures of Clostridia uh, difficile. So this marker is very useful in individuals who have severe gastrointestinal problems uh, and simultaneous psychiatric problems. So for example, a recent study found that uh, very high percentages of uh, uh, individuals with uh, depression have problems with uh, uh, Clostridia bacteria. The, these are the, uh, the biochemical structures of the compound, and, and uh, each one of these is what is called a phenol, which is a phenyl group, which is the six-member benzene ring plus a, uh, an oxygen and a hydrogen group. That makes it a, um, a phenyl plus an alcohol, which the chemist is called a phenol. So both the HPHPA and the cresol are phenols. There are other chemicals that also meet these criteria that are now undergoing research. So for example, it appears that one of the chemical breakdown products of the artificial sweetener uh, can also have uh, an effect similar to the Clostridia bacteria and altering uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, 
so the 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 uh, this particular compounds were found in really uh, two different uh, cases almost simultaneously. The first one uh, in which these discoveries of microbial metabolites associated with autism was published in uh, clinical chemistry. The uh, marker here shows that there were very high amounts of the chemical from uh, what that eventually was linked to uh, clostridia uh, in the two brothers with autism. Uh, but I also, uh, in almost exactly the same time, I had embarked on a, uh, a preliminary study with the uh, Children's Psychiatric Hospital in, uh, in Kansas City. I talked to the uh, director and indicated I had developed this new organic acid test, and with this I hoped to uh, find chemicals that would, could be causing uh, various psychiatric hospitals, and at the time he said, I know the exact person you need to test. I have a, a teenager who has attention deficit problem. He's diagnosed with uh, o ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. For those who are not psychiatrically versed, a, a simple description would be uh, that this ch child is hell on wheels and uh, uh, to deal with, and, and we did a baseline test and found high amounts of the chemical that was unknown when we first tested it, although even though it was unknown, I could detect some characteristics by looking at the fragments of the molecule and suspected that it was some type of phenolic structure but didn't know the exact structure, but later on it found that it was the HPHPA, and the child had um, a moderately elevated value. Uh, a few weeks later, uh, the child had to be hospitalized, and they took another urine sample, and at this point, uh, the child had these uh, massive amounts of this uh, HPHPA. It was the highest amount of a chemical that I had ever seen in urine. It was so high that most of the other chemicals in urine couldn't even be detected because it was like a tsunami of, of this uh, chemical that was being produced. So immediately when I saw this, I recognized that this was something important and that needed additional follow-up. It was like a eureka moment. And then a few minutes later, I thought, uh, wait a minute, Bill. What if this child is taking some antipsychotic medication and this is just a metabolite of, uh, at that time, I think phenothiazines were uh, still commonly used. And I thought, oh, shit. It's probably just a phenothiazine metabolite. But knowing I was doing this, I had collected a series of of uh, phenothiazine metabolites, and it did not match any of the phenothiazine metabolites. So, so I could go back to my celebration after uh, uh, after being delayed for about a day while I did the scientific uh, follow up, and found that indeed it was. It appeared that it, my first impression was right that it was a, a something of major uh, importance. And, and so this chemical comes from a series of clostridia bacteria and th that inhabit the uh, colon in most cases. This is the, uh, a, a, uh, a look, an endoscopy of a normal colon lining. You see it has the blood vessels and it's nice and, uh, uh, nice and pink and healthy. And this is the uh, endoscopy of a colon of a person with severe uh, clostridia difficile. I do want to emphasize that the, the HPHPA is not coming from clostridia difficile. So you can not only, you can't just do a C. difficile test and if it's negative, say the patient doesn't have the problem. Really the only way to diagnose this currently is by checking for these metabolites of clostridia, which we 
there's uh, four of them currently. We may expand it to additional ones, but stool testing, uh, current stool testing, cannot detect these other species, which are due to other species of Clostridia, not C. difficile. Uh, we find that most people have one or the other, but about one or two percent of patients may have both groups of both markers, the Cresol and the HPHPA. So the uh, illness that is caused by this is called pseudomembranous colitis because the bacteria have proliferated to such a degree that the, uh, it looks like it's some kind of membrane, which it is not, of course. It's just an overgrowth of bacteria. And this is uh, showing another uh, example of a patient with pseudomembranous colitis. This kind of thing is common in autism. I went to an autism conference and had talked to a parent whose child that had to have the, uh, the uh, part of the uh, colon removed because of this uh, severe colitis. Uh, whereas if he had done this testing uh, in advance, they could, have, they could have treated it easily and spared the surgery. Uh, so Clostridia has a rod-shaped uh, rod appearance under electron microscopy. And this is a big bunch of uh, Clostridia bacteria. Uh, one of the first uh, reports of clinical benefit uh, was published in Journal of Child Neurology uh, with a, uh, the co-author was a, uh, a Dr. Sidney Feingold, who is one of the premier anaerobic uh, microbiologist in the world, has written textbooks on anaerobic uh, microbiology, and actually he's, he, uh, he worked in this area at the VA hospital in, at, in uh, Los Angeles prior to his uh, retirement. And, and what the research group found is that using vancomycin, there was a significant improvement in autistic, uh, in autistic children and that uh, the problem was that when they uh, stopped the vancomycin, the, the children regressed. So, it, so this fits very well with the habits of, of Clostridia bacteria, which are they are spore formers. These Par the parent cells can be easily killed by vancomycin and flagell, but the spores uh, can't easily uh, be killed. And so what happens is following the cessation of the antibiotic treatment, the spores germinate and then cause the same problem again. So these are the, the uh, different species are, that produce HPHPA from my paper in Nutritional Neuroscience. Uh, so uh, Clostridia botulinum is one of the uh, bad, very bad players. Probably as a child, you may, may have been told, watch those cans when you buy those cans at the grocery store. If they're bulging out, don't, don't uh, open them up and eat the contents. And the reason is because they may have this Clostridia botulinum. However, there is another species of bacteria called Clostridium sporogenes that has identical uh, DNA with the exception of one gene. So all the genes of sporogenes are exactly the same as botulinum, except for the ability to produce the botulinum toxin. And this particular bacteria is used extensively in the medical industry. So what they do is, they want to find, when they want to sterilize something and find out if the sterilization was effective, they put spores of Clostridium sporogenes in there, thinking that this is safe since it doesn't make the botulinum toxin. 
And if it survives the auto, if it uh, survives the autoclaving, that means that the autoclaving sterilization was not effective. If they find no sporogenes afterwards, they say that it's that it is uh, safe. And one of the possibilities is that that uh, this is like the, somebody's opened all the cages at the zoo. If this stuff, if they're not careful with this stuff, thinking that it's safe, this may may have been causing an epidemic without anyone knowing, because nobody except these people checking autoclaves ever looks at this particular microorganism, but it is one of the main species that produces HPHPA. So even though it doesn't produce the botulinum toxin, it produces this chemical that has a profound effect on altering dopamine in the brain, causing extremely high amounts of dopamine, which are toxic, which then require drugs like uh, Haldol or Risperdal as anti-dopamine agents. Uh, the, uh, another one called calorotolerins is one, as the name indicates, that it tolerates extreme heat. And that's one of its, uh, so the other three produce less of the compound, but there are also possibilities. Another uh, thing th that is very concerning that I don't have the slides on is the fact that recently found that glyphosate, the most common weed killer in use throughout the world now, is also kills all the beneficial bacteria but does not kill Clostridia bacteria. And so individuals eating GMO food uh, or food that was not GMO but was sprayed with uh, a weed killer indirectly, all eating those food will kill all the beneficial lactobacillus in the intestinal tract, all the bif bifidobacteria, but does not kill Clostridia. And Clostridia can proliferate and in some cases, I'll bet there are cases of Clostridia botulinum uh, occurring in people being unrecognized. So almost nobody tests for Clostridia botulinum because it's considered a terrorist weapon. And so it is very difficult. I've tried to find a laboratory that would check people with this elevated HPHPA, but what they uh, 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 these laboratories, there's something like, I think, six in the world, and you have to get all these approvals from the government and so forth. Uh, these are species that do not produce HPHPA. So tetanus is not one of the ones that we're looking at. But we might be looking at botulinum. There, at this stage, there's no way of differentiating the different species. The good thing is that all of these species can be killed with uh, flagell or vancomycin. So the, the way Clostridia um, affects the brain is through the uh, catecholamine synthesis pathway. So catecholamines start with tyrosine that's converted to uh, dopa, Dopa is converted to uh, dopamine, and then dopamine is converted by the enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase uh, to norepinephrine and to epinephrine. So if this enzyme is blocked, not only do you have low amounts of norepinephrine, you also have low amounts of epinephrine. So one of the characteristics of people who have this enzyme blocked is a profound lack of energy because uh, if their blood sugar becomes low, they, they have very little uh, epinephrine or adrenaline. And so uh, if their blood sugar becomes low, they have no, uh, do not have adequate stimulation by, by epinephrine to stimulate the uh, liver to break down glycogen and form glucose. Uh, and the, 
The uh, critical thing here is that the clostridia inhibit this key enzyme. So people who have this disorder have elevated amounts of dopamine and low amounts of norepinephrine. And even though we haven't tested it yet, I'm sure when we do, we'll find out that they have low amounts of epinephrine as well. So this is an extremely common cause of uh, chronic fatigue, and I have case studies where a profound uh, relief of severe chronic fatigue syndrome by treating the underlying clostridia. I'm going to skip that and go to the, uh, the next slide showing the amount of the main dopamine metabolite, HBA, in autism compared to uh, normal individuals. So you see there's only two individuals in this group of uh, children with autism that overlap the, uh, the normal range. So this was a uh, probability of less than 0.01 of these uh, that, that says that these are insignificant, meaning a highly significant result. This finding has been replicated in other papers, and of course it's replicated by the fact that one of the main drugs used to treat the, the, the uh, most severe behavioral abnormalities in autism is Risperdal. It's the only drug approved for the treatment of, of uh, autism. And, the re and I'm convinced the reason it's effective is because all of these children have the clostridia problem. And I would say, I would even go further, and this is a guess, but I think it's a very educated guess. If you're thinking of putting anybody, anybody on Risperdal, you should first find out if they have Clostridia bacteria and if they have didopamine, rather than making them develop breast or uh, uh, develop uh, adult onset diabetes. I mean, all you're talking about is about a 30-day treatment with, with a, uh, an antibiotic that can resolve this problem. So, and, uh, so I'd like to find out uh, if somebody has an exception, somebody who does this, and I'd like to send me an email. I was thinking of putting this person, they were so disturbed. I wanted to put them on Risperdal, but I did your test and I found this and it works. So send me your case study. And if there's exceptions, I want to know about. I suspect that this is the main cause that people need, the main reason why anybody needs Risperdal, which, and of course, is they don't need Risperdal. So dopamine is high because the clostridia from either the C. difficile, the 4 cresol or the HPHPA are blocking the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine. And so dopamine is extremely high. Uh, and, and this is published. This, it, it, and... and, and uh, so the biochemists found a wide variety of compounds that have the same phenolic structure, including the 4-cresol itself, are potent inhibitors of dopamine beta-hydroxylase. And these things are not like partial inhibitors. They form covalent bonds with the active, in, uh, active enzyme site of the dopamine beta hydroxylase and completely inactivated. So even if the, the clostridia metabolite was removed, that enzyme is dead. So it can no longer function until the DNA is translated into RNA and the body makes new enzyme. So this is an extremely uh, in, uh, potent uh, inhibitor. So uh, this is one of the first completely worked out biochemical pathways of a combined human microbial metabolism. So this is showing the chemicals produced by uh, clostridia bacteria 
inhibiting this extremely uh, important uh, enzyme, the dopamine beta hydroxylase, and actually uh, this diagram appears on the uh, on the reports, organic acid test reports, so you can you can see the amount of the compound and how much it's affecting uh, dopamine metabolism. So, uh, dopamine at normal levels works very well, but at high concentrations, it's extremely toxic. Of all the neurotransmitters, dopamine is by far the most toxic neurotransmitter if it exceeds physiologic levels. Uh, and the other thing is the, the degradation of dopamine produces substances that cause oxidative stress and brain damage, which doesn't happen at physiologic levels, but you only need to exceed physiologic levels by a relatively modest amount to have these uh, toxic side effects happening. So, uh, in the normal person, 90% of dopamine is stored inside the synaptic vesicles. And, but if you have the problem with the clostridia blocking the conversion of dopamine, the dopamine cannot be stored in the existing synaptic vesicles, so it leaks out. And the pH of the cytoplasm is two pH units different than the pH inside of the synaptic vesicles. So remember, pH is a logarithmic function. So two pH units is a hundredfold difference in the hydrogen ion concentration. And so this dopamine that leaks out is very rapidly converted to toxic intermediates. Uh, and these toxic uh, intermediates cause uh, the formation of these uh, uh, oxidative species as well as have a direct effect on the architecture of the neurons and denaturing the mitochondria. So this is a complicated slide, so no way you're going to remember this, but what I want to uh, emphasize is that when... Uh, dopamine goes down this particular route because of being excess dopamine, it reacts with oxygen, forming oxygen superoxide. When that happens, this regenerates a, a toxic form of dopamine, so the process is repeated. So this is what is called a vicious cycle. So for every toxic form of dopamine that's produced, thousand molecules of oxygen superoxide forms, which can cause extreme damage to the, uh, to the brain. So a research group in Chile has been one of the, uh, on the forefront of uh, dopamine oxidation causing brain damage, and their focus is on Parkinson's, and, and what I believe is that the, uh, we've tested a number of patients with Parkinson's and seen the same high dopamine problem, which undoubtedly is damaging uh, the neurons. So it is, uh, it is ironic that, that high dopamine may be causing Parkinson's, and yet the individual, the physician, is giving L-dopa that makes even more dopamine the reason is because when the dopamine first reached these very high levels, it kills the dopamine-producing cells. And so the cells are not making adequate dopamine because of the clostridia. So I predict in 10 years, the whole, the, the, the whole treatment of Parkinson's disease will be different. It will be, it will be focused on controlling the problem with clostridia. So these high dopamine uh, molecules react with the structural elements in the brain, the tubulin, 
the, uh, the fibers that, caught, that are the architectural structural elements of the axon and also directly react with the enzyme of the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria, killing the mitochondria. So uh, dopamine, the, co the consequences, overstimulation of dopamine tracts. But what will happen, what if there, what, uh, if the body is so inhibited that it can't make nor norepinephrine, what will happen is dopamine will be the main neurotransmitter that's in the dopamine tracts because the body can't make norepinephrine. And there's several cases where this is true. In the beginning, I thought, well, it probably doesn't make any difference. You know, uh, uh, dopamine can stimulate the, the next neuron or norepinephrine. What's the big difference? Well, what I found is there's a profound difference between the physiologic action of dopamine and norepinephrine in, in rats that have mutations so they can't make nor norepinephrine exhibit no maternal um, uh, care behavior. They completely allow the baby rats to starve. So if they're given injections of norepinephrine, that behavior reverses. And there is now a way of getting around this as well. There's a pharmacologic in intervention called droxydopa, which is a way of producing norepinephrine if the main pathway for making it is broken. Uh, so uh, the high amounts of dopamine uh, kill the neurons at, at a certain level. They damage the mitochondria. They damage the architecture of the, of the dopamine-containing uh, neurons, and in addition, the dopamine reacts with glutathione, depletes glutathione, which is the main mechanism for the body to detoxify. So if, if glutathione is used up and the patient has toxic chemical exposure on top of it, which a lot of people are sitting in this room probably have, including myself, then, then there's going to be a further problem because the body will not be able to uh, detoxify toxic chemicals from the environment. So the, uh, the one part of the brain that probably everybody is of the substantia nigra, the black substance. So individuals who have Parkinson's, the, the, uh, the black color is missing because the uh, what, what I suspect is because of the Clostridia bacteria. So here's a case showing how closely the, the correlation is between the HPHPA and the uh, dopamine metabolite. So the uh, dopamine metabolite is the solid line and the HPHPA is the the dashed line. And so you see they're identical. So when HPHPA is high, dopamine is extremely high. And this isn't just a little high. This is a gigantic amount high. This is higher than most of the people who have a tumor secreting dopamine produce. And it's purely because of having extremely high amounts of the clostridia uh, metabolite. When dopamine is high, the, the, it's because there's an extremely high amount of the chemical HPHPA from clostridia. Uh, and there's a, a second case of, again, of severe autism. This is not just this isn't Dr. What's his name? Sean Murphy. This is not Sean Murphy. This is a person with autism who cannot walk, cannot talk, cannot lift their head very well, and, and, and is in uh, uh, older but maybe in diapers. So this causes extremely uh, severe uh, autism. And and as as you know, there's a, 
a parasympathetic and a sympathetic nervous system uh, that is part of what is called the autonomic nervous system. But if there's this block in the production of norepinephrine because of severe clostridia, there will be an absence of adequate norepinephrine for all of these uh, gut functions, you know, and all these autonomic functions, altering the functions of the heart, the lungs, um, the uh, pupils, and, and so forth, which is probably another reason for some of the severe abnormal uh, behavior in autism because all of these functions will uh, be altered as well. So the Clostridium uh, difficile, which is currently almost the only Clostridia species tested in, in virtually every hospital. There's virtually no hospital that tests anything except Clostridia difficile, but the, the HPHPA Clostridia is is about five times more common than this. So if you're only testing the C. difficile, you'll never, never, never find the most common thing, which is the HPHPA type of uh, Clostridia bacteria. So Clostridia is strict anaerobe. It dies when exposed to oxygen. Different species called tetanus, diarrhea, and botulism. And... Uh, the glyphosate is one of the main, uh, should be one of the main concerns for humanity now because not only is the glyphosate altering the flora in your intestinal tract, it's altering the flora of the intestinal tract on all the farm animals, the turkeys, the chickens, the cows. And there's an increasing number of cows that are dying of Clostridia botulinum. And I'll bet anything that the glyphosate is the underlying reason. It's killing all the normal bacteria in the fields where the cow are. In addition, most of the cows are getting GMO corn and soy to fatten them up prior to slaughter. And they, they call these cows that develop the Clostridia um, uh, botulinum downer cows because most cows won't are always standing. Cows are standing up even when they're sleeping unless they get the botulinum. So several uh, cows have found it, and now the report of farmers develop botulism. So this is affecting not only the the uh, uh, the intestinal tracts of people and the farm animals, it is likely altering all the soil over the whole earth is being altered as beneficial bacteria in the soil exposed to the glyphosate are being killed and, and being replaced. So this is a this is a lot more serious than that drill you experienced a little bit below. So that's what they should do. They should have a day where they ring the, the alarm and make everybody leave and realize that your entire earth is being contaminated with this product and it's being promoted by the government, by Trump's government is, is pushing this to, to expand it and push it uh, on more and more of our people and to promote its use throughout the world. Uh, the, uh, the, the organism forms spores that are resistant to heat and, and antibiotics, uh, but there's lots, the vancomycin and flagell kill the parent cells very well. The spores, it's interesting, they, they look like little tennis, microscopic tennis rackets. So the problem is, is that the is the spores. So there have been as many as 20 documented recurrences after the use of metronidazole or, be, because, or vancomycin because of these spores. Uh, I want to emphasize that the treatment for these is not intravenous because intravenous isn't going to hit the GI tract. It has to be oral uh, vancomycin or uh, flagell. 
Um, the other thing that's spreading this through the hospital like crazy is these alcohol hand wipes that you find in the visitors section, visiting rooms of the hospital. The alcohol has no effect on killing the clostridium. It may even be helping to spread it. So the person thinks after they've wiped their hands with this uh, alcohol wipe that they can then touch everybody in sight. And so those visitors are then spreading the Clostridia difficile everywhere, which is becoming one of the main problems in hospital uh, infection. The only household thing that kills spores is, is bleach. And so bleach is uh, um, uh, diluted bleach, uh, a 10, you know, bleach diluted one to 10 will be able to uh, kill the spores on the, um, on surfaces. Uh, so this shows a uh, individual with autism who at baseline had very high amounts of the clostridium metabolite, HPHPA, was put on metronidazole. After three weeks, there was no detectable uh, clostridium metabolite. At that time, the drug was stopped, and then you see within a short period of time, the metabolite returned. Uh, but there is a happy ending to this story. I don't want everybody leaving depressed. So this is what is called a pulsing method of treating clostridia, and it's extremely effective. And that is to not to use uh, uh, vancomycin continuously. You could probably also use flagellin the same way but it doesn't have scientific documentation, but there's every reason to believe it would work in the same way. And the idea is that you only give it the vancomycin one day, uh, and then you take away the drug for two days. And the takeaway time allows the spores to germinate, so then the next day you give the drug again, and then you can kill the spores that have germinated during that time period. So the dosing is one day on, two days off, and then repeat that same cycle for 30 days. And when, the, when that's done, there's only uh, about 5% of individuals who still have uh, clostridia remaining. So this is the one, if you're going to use the antibiotic approach, there are also a probiotic approach and I'm not sure if I'll have enough time to get to it, so I'm, I'm just going to say which one is called core biotics, and it is a probiotic that's very effective in controlling uh, clostridia. So which psychiatric disorders may the clostridia be present? Every single one. Every single one. So... You think, why doesn't this person want to eat? So one of the reasons is this person had extremely high amount of the clostridia metabolite. You see it's way off to the side of the chart. It's circled in red, indicating an extremely high value. And the patient has extremely high amounts of dopamine but extremely low amounts of norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is associated with normal behavior. And if you don't have normal behavior, if you won't care for your own children, you're not, probably not going to care for your own body as well. And, and, and so the problem is not likely due to the fact that this person saw skinny models. It's due to the fact that this person has extremely high amounts of this pathogenic bacteria that are causing excessive amounts of dopamine. And what happens if you eat a high protein food? Well, clostridia, to culture it, you put in meat broth. That is how you stimulate the growth of clostridia in the laboratory. So if this person is put on a diet that's high in protein, especially meat or fish, what they're doing is 
feeding the clostridia and making the problem worse. And so if this person experiences that, what they're gonna learn is, I go crazy, I feel terrible when I eat a, a high protein food and I'm not gonna do it anymore. And so this is a normal response to an abnormal infection. Uh, and in addition, this person has a double whammy because they also have very high amounts of fungal metabolites. And what do stimulates the growth of fungus? Carbohydrates. So whether you use the Atkins diet or you use the pig out diet on, on carbohydrates, it doesn't matter. Whichever food you take is gonna make you extremely sick. So the natural reaction is not eating and unless this thing is diagnosed, that probably is the best way that they starve out the abnormal flora. Uh, so this is a person with mental retardation. Again, a very high ratio of HVA to VMA, HVA being the dopamine metabolite, VMA, the norepinephrine and epinephrine metabolite. So this is one of the most useful pieces of information on the organic acid test is this particular uh, ratio. This is a vegetarian uh, with schizoid behavior and exactly the same thing. High amounts of the clostridia metabolites and an altered ratio of uh, HVA to VMA, indicating extreme uh, overabundance of dopamine. Early Parkinson's disease, again, extremely high amounts of the uh, clostridia metabolite and an extremely abnormal ratio of uh, HVA to VMA. And so this, I'm convinced, is the reason there's so many bad side effects with using L-DOPA, why the person has extremely abnormal behavior or even psychosis while on this drug because they may already have this extreme clostridia problem that is being, uh, that is being uh, affecting the person severely. Uh, this is a 65-year-old woman who's been ill for something like 20 years with both depression and bowel symptoms. Again, very high amounts of the clostridia, a very high ratio of HVA to VMA. After treatment, the uh, clostridia goes back to the uh, normal values and the ratio of HVA to VMA goes back into the uh, normal range with resolution of both her bowel problems and her severe depression. So really for 20 years she's suffered uh, because of the lack of knowledge of the fact that the gut flora can be the major thing in altering your brain. Uh, this is a six-year-old female with extreme aggression. Again, the the diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder, ODD, and this girl, again, has both problems, both, um, both high uh, uh, candida fungal species as well as high amount of clostridia species. So these, these people have to be treated doubly. They have to have the candida treatment. They have to have the clostridia treated. Uh, this is a case of a child with autism who had an extremely high amount of the uh, HPHPA uh, that was treated with, in this case, uh, just with a high doses of the probiotic lactobacillus acidophilus. This will work, but it's not as good as the core biotic product. I would estimate about 50% of cases uh, with clostridia respond, and the child also had high amounts of uh, candida, both in the stool and the organic acid test, 
and all of these normalized with a, a significant improvement in the autism after treating uh, the dysbiosis. Uh, this was a case study that was uh, written up in the Nutritional Neuroscience uh, uh, article. It was a, uh, a psychiatrist had come to one of my lectures, and then a few weeks later, her daughter, 21-year-old daughter, had uh, a first episode of uh, acute psychosis with auditory hallucinations. She did the testing and found out that her daughter at this time had set the record for the highest amount of the clostridium metabolite. Uh, she was treated with uh, antibiotics. She was not given any neuroleptic drug. All of the uh, psychotic episode resolved after the treatment of the uh, clostridia. Uh, this is a person with severe depression and chronic fatigue. And again, the, uh, the chronic fatigue was so bad that she was on Medicare disability. She couldn't work. She could uh, most of the time just barely get out of bed to go to the bathroom. And after being treated, uh, after treating the clostridia, she was able to go back to work in a very short period of time and get off uh, welfare. So, so this will cause extreme fatigue because when the clostridia is this high, remember, you can't make norepinephrine, but you can't make epinephrine either. So if you can't make epinephrine, you can't, you can't respond to any kind of uh, stress. And so your blood sugar is just going to be low continuously because you have no epinephrine to stimulate the liver to break down glycogen to glucose. So the, uh, the, some of the treatments, these are, this is the standard treatment, but remember, I don't recommend the standard treatments. What you can use this slide for is for the dosing on the day that you do it. I strongly recommend you use the pulsing method, not the one where you give the antibiotic continuously for seven to 10 days because in most of the cases, it's going to come back. Uh, it seems that metronidazole may have more side effects than, than, uh, uh, than the vancomycin, but it's still lots of uh, feedback from lots of people. The majority of people don't have these but you need to be aware of it if you're going to use this. The metronidazole is way cheaper than the vancomycin. Vancomycin's a lot more expensive. Uh, the, the, uh, the nutritional neuroscience article showing that autistic boys have much, much higher amounts of the uh, clostridia bacteria. Uh, one of the child, one of the children uh, had a that we tested at the time was having a psychotic episode. The mother was bringing him to the ER and he kicked the windows out of the car while she was transporting him to the hospital. Uh, so uh, the results are found in both males and females and this is an extremely common cause of autism. So two thirds of the children had uh, high values of the HPHPA. And actually, this was testing before we were testing the other metabolite, the Cresol. So if you added that one together, it's probably even higher than two-thirds. Um, the organic acid test is very useful because the uh, some of the stool tests are testing all clostridia. And so, as you saw from the previous diagram, all clostridia don't produce these compounds. It's only certain species. There was about, I think it was uh, seven or eight species that produce this. So if you do total clostridia on stool testing, take that result and very carefully put it in the trash can because it will not tell you what the problem is. And some clostridia are beneficial, some are harmful, some are, are in the middle. So the organic acid test 
test the very compound that attacks the enzyme in the brain, the dopamine uh, beta hydroxylase. And with the organic acid test, you find out the severity of the problem by looking at the dopamine and norepinephrine and seeing the altered ratios. Uh, so this is a, a, another child with autism with both the problems. Uh, the same child was tested with a stool test using DNA, and the total clostridia was indicated was low. So on this, this is the same exact child that had a high amount of clostridia on the organic acid test, and when they did the DNA test, it said clostridia was low, and the problem is this test is checking for total clostridia. So total clostridia is totally use, useless. Uh, NutraSweet at very high levels can do the same thing. So this is a patient who doesn't have clostridia, yet has a gigantic amount of dopamine and low norepinephrine. And it's because the metabolite of NutraSweet, which is aspartame, another gift of Monsanto, is, uh, is, uh, has this phenolic hydroxyl group that can inhibit this. And so one of my projects is to prove this. This is a suspicion based on this clinical case. What I've planned on doing in a couple of months is starting a project to test each of the uh, other chemicals that are common in, the, uh, in our diet that have this phenolic structure on dopamine beta hydroxylase. Uh, so the organic acid test can be uh, very useful because uh, not only does it measure the clostridia that are causing the problem, but it, it, it can indicate the severity of problem on neurotransmitters. And I want to say, just because I say neurotransmitters doesn't mean all these things are produced in the brain. These neurotransmitters are produced by the peripheral nervous system as well. So to me, it doesn't matter, though, whether the, dop the dopamine's affected in the brain or the peripheral nervous system because it's the same enzyme in the brain and the peripheral nervous system that's being effective. So the naysayers will say, these people are making claims. I do not claim that this compound is produced by brain, although a small portion is, but all of these chemicals are produced by neurotransmitters. Uh, there's also a 4-hydroxyphenylacetic acid uh, that is uh, a clostridium metabolite. All these different metabolites are on the organic acid test. The HVA-VMA ratio tells you the proportion of dopamine and norepinephrine. The normal person should have a value of one. We found some individuals with a, a ratio as high as 100 to one with the clostridia problem. We have vitamin B6. Cresol is an indicator of clostridia difficile, but the majority of individuals with psychiatric problems don't have cresol. The HPHPA is about five or maybe six times more prevalent than the cresol. Uh, so the clinical usefulness of clostridia is really in all the uh, psychiatric and uh, uh, neurologic uh, diseases. But in addition, we found cases of arthritis that are associated with the clostridia. Found cases of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Found cases of seizure disorders. So it's an extremely wide thing that's extremely common in, in all uh, psychiatric illnesses. Thank you.